Uh, I think Dundee, uh, Inverness and Glasgow and this is the last of the events in, 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 in Scotland. Without any further ado, please welcome Mr Thomas Suarez. Thank you all of you for being here today. I know there's a lot to choose from in Edinburgh, so I'm very grateful that you're here. My great thanks to Khalid, to Scottish PSC, Nick Napier, and of course the Telcourse Community Centre for making this possible. I should explain that the source for everything I will say here tonight is cited in my book, State of Terror. Most is taken directly from the classified source documents held by the National Archives in Kew. In addition, I have made available online a selection of these source documents. The, uh, the web address for that is paldocs.net. That's P-A-L-D-O-C-S dot N-E-T, short, of course, for Palestine documents. This page includes a link to book errata, and for any of you that do read the book, I do suggest that you check the errata. The list is short, but it's important. Our topic is, of course, the so-called conflict in Israel-Palestine, which is anything but a conflict in the true sense of the word. And I would have no business taking your time here today unless I thought I might have something constructive to add to the collective efforts to bring justice and with justice peace. So first, I owe you an explanation of my thinking. My starting point is this. The injustice against Palestine is horrific and it could not be more blatant, especially with today's instant global communications. Yet, it has endured for one and a third centuries and counting, and is not merely tolerated, but is actively empowered by the same allegedly enlightened nations that profess to be beacons of justice and freedom. Thus, for Israel-Palestine, truth, facts, information, knowledge, laws, morality, logic, have no effect, as though Israel-Palestine exists all by itself in an alternate universe. The world stares at the never-ending theft of land, the never-ending ethnic cleansing, repression, siege, dehumanization, racism, ongoing and relentless, and these punctuated by major terror attacks. Protective Edge, thank you, Protective Edge, Castled, Sabrachatila, Kivya, to cite just a few of these. And bear in mind that most of the victims of these terror attacks were already refugees victims of Israeli ethnic cleansing. Yet, Israel infallibly succeeds in spinning its actions as self-defense, and we, collectively, allow our governments, for whatever their own game plans, to empower it financially, militarily, and economically. For a reality check, just imagine for a moment how the so-called international community would react if the ethnicities in this conflict were reversed. So it seems to me that this disconnect must first be deconstructed in order for what is in front of the world's eyes to matter, and thus for the conflict to become untenable. Whatever your views on it, the origins and driving force behind the conflict, of course, lie in Zionism. And so we need to start at Israel's narrative, its creation, its autobiography, its self-identity. Israel spins itself as not merely a political entity like any other nation state, but as the rebirth of the Old Testament kingdom, whose name Zionist leaders adopted for that strategic and, I would say, manipulative purpose, striking a powerful chord in the collective Western subconscious even reconstituting the biblical realm's language, not spoken as a vernacular for nearly two millennia as the nation state's native tongue. The imagery and the marketing had to be complete. This messianic narrative had to be inseparable from the nation state and to accomplish this, Israel encapsulated it into a three word mantra. The Jewish state, make any attempt to address the conflict and you will instead hit this three-word self-identity that Israel uses as a human shield, consisting of Jewry itself and all that goes with it. This self-identity is qualitatively distinct from any other nation's association with any other religion or cultural group. Judaism is not Israel's state religion in the sense of a national faith that any nation might adopt. 
Rather, Israel, exploiting the classic anti-Semitic notion of the Jews as a tribe, a race apart, presents itself as the Jewish state, the very embodiment of Jewry itself, of Jewish history, culture, and persecution. It is to assert this strategic embodiment of, of all Jewry that Israel refuses to allow the concept of an Israeli nationality. By Israeli law, the nationality of Jewish citizens of Israel is Jewish. And repeated legal challenges to this abuse have all failed. Any acknowledgement of a Jewish individual free of an implicit link to the so-called Jewish state would undermine Israel's messianic self-identity, its pretense of ownership of Jews because they are Jews. A principal justification being flaunted by Israeli apologists is that Zionism is Jewish self-determination. It is exactly the opposite. It is the denial of Jewish individual self-identity and self-determination. To put this in context, no nation claims it is, just to use another example, the Catholic state. Costa Rica is a Catholic state. It does not suggest that it owns Catholicism, Catholics, or historic Christian martyrdom. We do not have political pressure groups, mass readiness charities, smearing us as anti-Catholic bigots if we criticize Costa Rica. Nor does Costa Rica claim an exclusive franchise on Catholicism. Several nations maintain Catholicism as a national faith. Israel would never acknowledge even the possibility of another Jewish state because it asserts implicit ownership over all Jewry, holding Jewry hostage to shield its crimes from scrutiny. Thus, Israel, taken at its word, makes Jews, simply by virtue of being Jews, partner to whatever it does. The profound anti-Semitism of this is self-evident and I believe will be the undoing of the conflict. Zionism was, of course, among the incarnations of racial nationalism that evolved in the late 19th century. Bigots were Zionism's avid fans. Gertrude Bell, the famous English writer, traveler, archaeologist, and spy, reported, based on her experience, that those who supported Zionism did so because it provided a way to get rid of Jews. Most Jews had fought for equality and resented being told that they should now make yet another ghetto, and worse yet, to do so on other people's land. They resented being cast as a separate race of people, as Zionism demanded. They had had quite enough of that from non-Jewish bigots. The year 2017 is, of course, the centennial of the British original sin in this tragedy, the Balfour Declaration. What is irrefutable in British records is that Balfour and the other officials involved knew, they knew then, that the Zionists intended to seize all of Palestine and expel Nazis from it. Most active at the time were Hein Weizmann and Baron Rothschild, with Weizmann demanding that his Zionist state extend all the way to the Jordan River within three or four years of the Declaration, that is, by 1921, and then expand beyond it. They treated the ethnic cleansing of non-Jewish Palestinians as indispensable to their plans, and they insisted that the British lie about the scheme until it is too late for anyone to do anything about it. In correspondence with Balfour, Weizmann justified his lies with racist slurs against the Palestinians and Jews, that is, non-Zionist Jews, and especially, especially the Middle East indigenous Jews, who were overwhelmingly opposed to the Zionist project and whom Weizmann smeared with classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. The Palestinians, the Palestinians he dismissed as, in so many words, a lower type of human. And this was among the reasons he and, and other Zionist leaders used for refusing simple democracy in Palestine. If the Arabs, the Palestinians, had the vote, he said, it would lower the Jew down to the level of a native, to use his word. By about 1920, four decades of peaceful Palestinian resistance had proved futile, and the late 1920s brought the first of two violent Palestinian uprisings. Whereas Palestinian terrorists, or resistance fighters, whichever you judge them, were loosely knit groups operating outside the Palestinian villages, Zionist terror organizations operated from within the Jewish settlements, 
and were actively empowered and shielded by those settlements and by the Jewish agency, the recognized semi-autonomous ruling body of the Jewish settlements, what would, in 1948, become the Israeli government. These Zionist terror organizations attacked anyone in their way, whether the Palestinians, Jews, or the British. There were three major terror organizations that dominated Palestine during these years. The Haganah, formed in 1920 and in large part trained by the British, was originally a defensive militia in the sense that it defended the settlements from reprisals by those it had displaced, whether one can justly call that defense is another question. Its offshoot, the Irgun, was formed in 1931 to engage in more indiscriminate terror, and the Irgun's offshoot, Lehi, better known as the Stern Gang, after its first leader, was formed with the onset of World War II by Irgun members who saw no difference between the Axis powers and the Allied powers, and therefore saw no reason to moderate their terror during the war. The Haganah and the Irgun did not stop their terror during the war, but they toned it down for a while. But this was purely pragmatic. In late 1942, Irgun head and future Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin judged that he had been wrong to think earlier on that an Allied victory would necessarily bring a Zionist state. And so halfway through the war, he too abandoned restraint and the Haganah soon followed suit. Although their styles and focus were different, there was no substantive difference between the Irgun and Lehi and the Jewish agency's Haganah. The Jewish agency cooperated and collaborated with the Irgun and Lehi and even helped finance the Irgun. The Irgun in particular would act on behalf of the Haganah so that the Jewish agency could feign innocence after a terror attack. The Jewish agency tolerated little dissent and sought to dictate the fates of all Jews. And so the indoctrination of children was vital to the Zionist project. The first time I am aware of this extremism coming to wide public light was on the 8th of July, 1938. On that day, the Aragon blew up a bus filled with Palestinian villages. Now, this was not the first time the Aragon had done something of this sort, but this time the British caught the alleged bomber. She was a 12-year-old schoolgirl, apparently egged on by three adults. Indeed, Jewish teenagers, both boys and girls, were commonly used to carry out Zionist terror attacks, and this continued throughout to the ethnic cleansing of 1948. For example, when shortly before the partition resolution of November 1947, the British uncovered a Lehi terror school, many of the inductees were, to quote the British, children of tender years, both boys and girls. Adolescents of both sexes were among the terror militia that massacred the village of Dar Yassin several months later, Dar Yassin being the best known, but just one of many such massacres. Teachers were threatened or removed if they tried to intervene in the indoctrination of their students, and the students themselves were blocked from advancement if they resisted. Jews who opposed and tried to warn of the emerging fascism were assassinated. And indeed, most victims of Zionist assassination, that is, a specifically targeted individual rather than indiscriminate murder, were Jews. Palestinian armed resistance ended before the outbreak of World War II. Through to late 1947, there were virtually no Palestinian attacks, even though Zionist terrorism steadily increased. Between 1939 and 1947, as Zionist terrorism ravaged Palestine and brought the country to its knees, Palestinians maintained stoic non-violence. A British explanation for the Palestinians' refusal to respond in kind was that they understood that the attacks were a trap, intended to elicit a response that the Zionists would then frame as a threat against which they would have to defend themselves. Indeed, this was a Zionist tactic alluded to by the British as early as 1918, and it, of course, remains Israel's principal strategy today. Terrorize until there is a reaction, and then broadcast that reaction as an unprovoked attack. 
To be treated as most secret is the reading heading of the transcript of a key meeting of 20 people, including the top Zionist leaders, that was held in London on the 9th of September, 1941, setting the direction for Palestine's future. It is worth summarizing from this meeting because it is typical of what went on behind the scenes and is an almost comical laying bare of the hypocrisy of Zionist, now Israeli, claims of democracy and equal rights. Indeed, the conversation sounds like it anticipates George Orwell's then still to be written Animal Farm. Present were Weizmann, who had called the meeting, David Van Gurion, and other Zionist leaders such as Simon Marx of Marx and Spencer, and the prominent non-Zionist industrialist Robert Welly Cohen. There is no ambiguity that takeover and ethnic cleansing of all of Palestine was always had been and remained the plan. Anthony Rothschild began by stressing that there would be, quote, no discrimination against any group of its citizens in the Jewish state. Weizmann and Ben-Gurion also assured the skeptics, Arabs, Palestinians, would have equal rights. However, they clarified that within that absolute equality, Jewish settlers would have to have special privileges. And so, Weizmann's, quote, absolute equality required the transfer of most non-Jews out of Palestine while permitting, quote, a certain percentage of Arab and other elements, whatever other elements is, he doesn't explain, to remain in his Jewish state, the insinuation being as a pool of cheap labor. Anthony Rothschild's vision of equality and non-discrimination was equally compelling. It, quote, depended on turning an Arab majority into a minority. And to achieve this, there would be, quote, no equal rights for non-Jews. Cohen, the industrialist, found the scheme terrifying. He submitted that the Zionists were, and I quote him, starting with the kinds of aims with which Hitler had started. He proposed instead that the state not be predicated on race, not be predicated on religion, and that it be named with a neutral geographic term. He proposed Palestine. The others were horrified at this idea, arguing that if the state did not have a Jewish name, quote, they would never get a Jewish majority. Acknowledging the use of messianic fundamentalism as a cynical political strategy for the settler state. In another obvious but never publicly spoken admission, Ben-Gurion clarified that his Jewish state was not based on Judaism. It was rather based on Jews as a race, which until Zionism had been classic anti-Semitism. Asked about the borders of his settler state, Weizmann continued in the same surreal manner. He said that he would consider the, the partition plan proposed by the Peel Commission four years earlier, in 1937. The Peel Commission, of course, having been the first to formally propose partition. But, he said, the line, the partition, would have to be the Jordan River. Now, this was nonsense. The Jordan River was the Peel Commission's eastern boundary for the two states. And so, Weizmann's partition was 100% of the Zionists and 0% of the Palestinians. And he went further still. He would quote, very much like to cross the Jordan, that is, take Transjordan along with Palestine. At the end of the meeting, Weizmann sought to put his proposals into effect officially in the name of all Jews. Those against his proposal were, in his word, you guessed it, anti-Semites. As they were speaking, World War II was raging. What was the Jewish agency's reaction? to the most terrible enemy Jewry has ever known? From the beginning, it was to lobby the Yishur, the Jewish settlers, not to enlist in the Allied struggle against the Nazis, because doing so would not serve Zionism. It was to conduct a massive theft ring of Allied weapons and munitions, as if, as one British military record put it, as if paid by Hitler himself. It was to continue the violence in Palestine, taking resources and personnel away from the war effort. And after the Allied victory, it was to exploit for extortion the fact that Britain's struggle against the Nazis had brought it to economic ruin. Ben-Gurion and other Zionist leaders pressured the United States not to approve its post-war loan to Britain unless 
Britain acceded to Zionist demands. Much has been written on the collaboration between the Zionists and the Nazis during the war, the best known, of course, being the Havara Transfer Agreement that broke the anti-Nazi boycott. One of the least known collaborations or attempted collaborations with the fascists was Lehi's attempted collaboration with the Italian fascists. In its nearly concluded Jerusalem Agreement of late 1940, Lehi offered to support the fascists in the war, in exchange for which the fascists at the end of the war would use its military power to destroy Jewish communities not in Palestine and force their people to Palestine. Now, if this sounds like a scheme so extreme that only fanatical Leahy could have conjured it, it is essentially what the Israeli state ultimately succeeded at in the early 1950s, most catastrophically when it conducted a false flag terror campaign against Jews in Iraq to destroy that ancient Jewish community and force its people to Israel as ethnic fodder. German Jewish immigrants to Palestine during the war were outraged by the Zionist exploitation of the Nazi horrors they had just fled. This outrage was given voice by, among others, the prominent journalist Robert Welch. He had been editor of a Berlin newspaper until that paper was banned by the Nazis in 1938. Welch warned that Zionist leaders, and I quote him, have not yet understood that the enemy seeks the destruction of the Jews. We, who have been here only a few years, we know what Nazism is. Zionists rather are, quote, taking part in the crash of European Jewry only as spectators, now I paraphrase, fighting the British and keeping Jews from joining the Allied struggle while getting comfortable and rich from their political project in Palestine. Recent immigrants from Germany and Central Europe, he said, have no representation among the Zionist ruling establishment. If they did, quote, we would have demanded that the Yishev should put itself at the disposal of Britain for the fight against Hitler and Nazism. But, and I am still quoting him, they do not want to fight against Hitler because his fascist methods are also theirs. They do not want our young men to join the forces, the Allied forces, Day after day, they are sabotaging the English war effort. These German Jewish immigrants were shunned by the Zionists, their publications and their presses bombed. Even kiosks were bombed for selling non-Hebrew papers to German Jewish immigrants. In 1943, a man whom British records describe as a Jew whose integrity is not open to question risked his life to warn about the threat of Zionism. For his safety, he was referred to only by the code name Z. Z described Zionism as a parallel movement to Nazism. He warned that the Zionist indoctrination of Jewish youth was producing a society of extremists who will use any method necessary to achieve Zionist goals. And he pointed out that as fascism in Europe has now demonstrated, such a society is very difficult to undo once it has taken root. And the result, I'm afraid, is what the Palestinians now face day to day in the so-called conflict. How trustworthy is this anonymous testimony? Well, I found in the National Archives a private letter in which Z is identified. He was J.S. Bentwich, the senior inspector of Jewish schools in Palestine. A report by U.S. intelligence in the Middle East, dated the 4th of June, 1943, was entitled The Latest Aspects of the Palestine Zionist Arab Problem. Not the Jewish Arab Problem, the Zionist one. The report described Zionism in Palestine as, quote, a type of nationalism which in any other country would be stigmatized as retrograde Nazism, and stated that anti-Semitism was essential to it. Whereas, quote, Assimilated Jews in Europe and America are noted for being stout opponents of racialism and discrimination. Zionism has bred the opposite mentality, a spirit closely akin to Nazism. The report refuted Zionist propaganda, then already common, about having made the desert bloom. It noted the irony that it was from the Palestinians that the settlers learned, among many other things, the cultivation of the Yaffa oranges. And whereas the Palestinians are self-sufficient, the Zionist settlements exist only on massive external financing. 
And should the settlements after, ever have to survive on their own merits, as the Palestinians do, quote, the venture will collapse like a pricked balloon. The conclusion of this early US intelligence report was, however, naive, or at least it was premature. Now that the world, quote, has seen the lengths to which the Nazi creed has carried the nations, it reasoned that the Zionists, quote, are due to find themselves an anachronism. Now, I'd like to say a word about all these Nazi-Zionist parallels. Such parallels continued with the behavior of the early Israeli state into the, into the 1950s and have since become a great taboo. For myself, unless there is some specific historical reason for doing so, I do not make the parallel. I don't make it for two reasons. One, because it's, it's a distraction, but more so because I don't see why we should need to be jarred by the word Nazi and its reference to European suffering to acknowledge that generations of people in Palestine, in the many refugee camps, and within Israel have been robbed of normal lives so that a privileged quote-unquote race can usurp and rule. In the cause of Zionism, Gaza has been reduced to a laboratory for sadism and weapons testing. And human beings, yes, human beings have been reduced to intervention in the cause of Zionism. That is the reality with or without the word Nazism. The plight of European Jews served the Zionist project, not the other way around. In fact, the most deadly terror attack of the entire mandate period was not the bombing of the King David Hotel in 1946, as is commonly said. Even some of the Irgun's bombings of Palestinian markets killed more people than died in the King David attack. But the single most deadly terror attack of the entire period was the Jewish agency's bombing of the Jewish immigrant ship Patria in 1940, killing an estimated 267 people, most of whom were Jews fleeing the Nazis. Now, the, the reason the Jewish agency bombed the Patria was that it was bringing the, the DPs, the displaced people, to Mauritius, where they would be safe from the war and where the British had facilities for them but the Zionist settler project needed them in Palestine. So the Zionist version of history is that the agency meant only to disable the ship. But this is an absurd argument. When you blow up a ship, you cannot then say that you didn't need to hurt anybody. The fact is that the agency placed its need for ethnically correct settlers above the lives of the people in order to get the survivors to remain, which indeed they did. In further violence against its Jewish victims, the agency framed them for its crime and exploited them for propaganda. It spread the lie that the DPs themselves blew up the vessel, that they committed mass suicide because they could not bear not to go directly to Palestine, posthumously framing the very people they had killed to serve the Zionist myth. And this, by the way, was not the only Jewish immigrant ship that the Jewish agency bombed for its own political reasons. Another principal form of Zionist violence against Jews was the sabotage of safe haven in order to force them to Palestine. For example, in early 1944, President Roosevelt succeeded in principle in establishing a half million new homes for European DPs, most of these homes in the United States and in Britain. U.S. Zionist leaders were outraged at this and sabotaged it. When Roosevelt's aide, Morris Ernst, confronted U.S. Zionist leaders in an attempt to save the program, he was, in his words, thrown out of parlors and accused of treason. Why treason? Treason because Morris Ernst was Jewish and the Zionist claimed to own Jews. Nor were those already settled safe. In 1946, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Palestine Yitzhak Herzog conduct, conducted a massive kidnapping operation of orphans of Jewish background that had been adopted by European families when their parents perished years earlier. Removing 10,000 children from their homes was the number he freely cited to the New York Times as his goal for the kidnapping trip. In the National Archives, I found a copy of his record of the trip. In it, Herzog complains of the fierce resistance he met from horrified local Jewish leaders who tried to protect the children, but he used his clout to circumvent them. 
In France, for example, facing the steadfast refusal of the Jewish leaders to betray the children, Herzog, I quote him, I demanded promulgation of a law which would oblige every family to declare the particulars of the children it houses, now I paraphrase, so that those of Jewish background could be exposed and put back in orphanages until they can be shipped to Palestine. Quite a Kafkaesque twist on Passover for these children who had just been spared the Nazis. Herzog's justification for the kidnappings was that for a child of Jewish background to be raised in a non-Jewish home is, quote, much worse than physical murder. Yet even this bizarre justification fails to explain what was actually happening. Because at the same time Herzog was rescuing Jewish children from this fate much worse than physical murder, his Jewish agency colleagues were sabotaging Jewish adoptive homes in England for young survivors still in the camps. The real reason for all of it, of course, was that the children were needed to serve the settler project as demographic fodder. To that end, the Jewish agency had coerced President Truman to segregate Jewish DPs into Zionist-run camps. Despite objections even from staunchly pro-Zionist Churchill that this echoed Nazi behavior. The camps nurtured such fanaticism that it shocked a joint US-UK committee that visited them in 1946. Before these camps, few Jewish DPs wanted to go to Palestine. But now, the committee found, them, found these same DPs in a delirious state, threatening mass suicide if they did not go to Palestine. Even the offer of new homes in the United States, which had always been the favored destination, was suddenly met with threats of mass suicide. DPs were also groomed in these camps to bring Zionist terrorism to Europe, bombing Allied trains and Allied facilities. The bombing of the British Embassy in Rome in 1946, for example, was by DPs brainwashing these camps. As was a near catastrophe in the Austrian Alps in the summer of 1947, when DPs nearly blew an Allied train off a steep trestle into a deep abyss, which would almost certainly have sent its 200 civilians and Allied troops returning home to their deaths. Behind closed doors, the Jewish agency discussed its enemies, and what it considered enemies in the 1940s says quite a bit about the present. Its enemies were democracy, the Atlantic Charter, which of course became the basis for the United Nations, reconstruction, and the fall in anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism having always been Zionism's drug, without which it would become irrelevant. The agency blamed what it perceived to be declining anti-Semitism in the United States on what it called America's, quote, democratic attitude. Now, today, when anything approaching this topic is raised, it is twisted by some into the pejorative misstatement that the speaker, in this case me, is blaming Jews for anti-Semitism. No, that's not what I'm doing. It is the fact that Zionism, Zionism requires anti-Semitism and seeks to ensure that it, or at least the appearance of it, never ends, and this at the expense of Jews. I also mention Reconstruction. Zionist leaders were afraid that with the improvement of conditions in Europe, the pressure on Palestine would subside. Indeed, Ben-Gurion initiated a policy of non-cooperation with Reconstruction well before the war ended beginning in mid-1943. By 1946, Zionist terrorism had become the defining daily challenge of life in Palestine, and 100,000 British troops proved unable to contain it. Anyone or anything that kept Palestine a functioning society was a target of the Zionists. Trains, roads, bridges, communications, oil facilities, and Coast Guard stations were constantly being bombed utility workers, telephone repairmen, railway workers, bomb disposal personnel were murdered. Police, and especially Jewish police, were long a favored target of the Zionists and were gunned down by the dozens. Among the smaller terror organizations that popped up was one specifically dedicated 
to the Zionist long-running fear of Jews befriending non-Jews. The ultimate fear, of course, being polluting what for the Zionist was the pure Jewish race. As a sample of its methods, the terror group is said to have doused a disobedient Jewish girl with acid, severely injuring her and blinding her in one eye. Zionist terror was aided by the Jewish agency's phenomenal intelligence network. The Jewish agency had informers all the way to high-placed, sympathetic U.S. officials, such that the British learned not even to trust direct messages to U.S. President Truman. When the U.N.'s Palestine Committee, UNSCA, visited Palestine in the summer of 1947, the agency had already replaced the committee members' drivers with spies, had replaced the waiters in the main restaurant they frequented with spies, and most productively sent five young women at, uh, to serve at what they called a theater network of house attendants at the building where the UNSCOP committee, all men, were being housed. The young women were required to be smart and educated, but above all, in the Jewish agency's word, they were required to be daring. Whatever daring meant, these young women extracted a wealth of information from the key people who were then deciding Palestine's future. Jewish sex workers were involuntarily recruited as spies. They were told that upon the Zionist victory, which they were assured was imminent, they would be executed for cavorting with the enemy, but might be spared if they cooperated as spies now. The practice was so widespread that a standard questionnaire was printed up that the women were to fill out after each British customer. Illustrative of the degree to which Zionist plants infiltrated the government in everyday life, a couple of months after one Coast Guard station was attacked and bombed by the Haganah, it blew up again. But this time, the British were baffled because the second time, there had been no attack. It just blew up. They discovered that the construction crew that had rebuilt it after the previous attack were Haganah and had simply embedded explosives in the reconstruction. But the worst problem of infiltration was in the military service, where deadly sabotage by Zionist plants who had joined the forces led, tragically, to orders to remove all Jews from service in Palestine because there was no way to tell the Zionists from the Jews. By 1948, this problem spread to key medical personnel. After the Jewish agency poisoned the water supply of Acre with typhoid in order to expedite the ethnic cleansing of the city, which of course lies on the Palestinian side of partition, the Jewish bacteriologist hired by the British proved to be a Zionist planter sympathizer, an obstacle to the availability of a vaccine. Selling terror required effective marketing. And for this as well, the agency exploited the plight of European Jews. A clear example of this is the iconic Zionist immigrant story, the USS Warfield, renamed the Exodus for the obvious biblical iconography. The arrival of the Exodus at the shores of Palestine was timed for Unscuffed's visit there. It was sold to the world as the desperate attempt of 4,515 survivors of the Holocaust to reach their last hope of safety and a new life, their promised land. The British instead forced them back, not just to Europe, but to their ultimate nightmare, Germany. Well, that was the story the US and European public got. In truth, the Exodus was a cynical propaganda event. It was grand theater, not for the benefit, but at the expense of Jewish survivors. The Jewish agency knew that the Exodus passengers would be turned back because, for among other reasons, the flooding of Palestine with settlers was a tactic to force Zionist political goals. And remember that the entire human cargo of the Exodus equaled less than 1% of President Roosevelt's resettlement plan that the Zionists had sabotaged three years earlier. The DPs themselves were products of the Zionist camps and had been rehearsed to repeat, as one witness described it, whatever Zionist mumbo-jumbo was demanded of them. As for the return to Germany, it was the Jewish agency, not the British, that forced the DPs back to Germany. Attempts were being made to find new homes for the Exodus passengers elsewhere. Denmark was one possibility. 
but this was sabotaged by Ben-Gurion because it would spoil the Exodus theater. There was, in fact, already an alternative to Germany. All the Exodus DPs had the right to disembark in southern France rather than continue to Germany. But the agency used force to prevent the DPs from leaving the ships. I should mention, by the way, that any of you that read the Wikipedia entry on the Exodus, that entry in recounting the uh, episode in southern France, it cites a single source, a secondary source, that I've never heard of, in stating that the Haganah encouraged the DPs to leave the ships in southern France. All I can tell you is that it's, it's I have no doubt that the, that the Haganah spun it that way, but the, the source documents for this, there is so much contradictory evidence that it, it, this is not possible. In fact, the British actually, while well, the, there were three ships that returned the uh, Exodus passengers back, while they were, they were uh, parked off of southern France, the British went to Golda Meir, who, whose name was then Meyerson. They went to her and they called her bluff. They said that obviously none of us want the DPs to be forced to go back to Germany. But they, they're not getting off the ships. Maybe, maybe they, they're not aware of it, or maybe they don't believe us because we're British. So why don't you, Golda Meir, tell them that they're free to leave the ships? Her response to the British was, no Jew could tell another Jew to go any place except to Palestine. She refused. To paraphrase Israeli professor Edith Zertal, the greater the suffering of these survivors of the Holocaust, the greater their political and media effectiveness for the Zionists. A few months after the exodus, in November 1947, the UN, violating its own charter, blocked Palestinian self-determination and recommended partition with the implicit creation of a Zionist state. The creation of the Israeli state was the direct capitulation to Zionist terrorism. Let me repeat that. Resolution 181 and the creation of the Israeli state was the surrender to the certainty of Zionist terrorism against the West. Caving to that terrorism enabled the West to confine the victims of that continuing terrorism to the Palestinians. The alternate UN plan was for a binational state, which the British believed that the Palestinians would have reluctantly supported as a compromise to their desire and their absolute right for a single democratic state. But this compromise would be, to quote then secret British papers, totally unacceptable to the Zionists. And therefore, since it was totally unacceptable to the Zionists, it would be, quote, followed by an intensification of Jewish terrorism. In other words, it was the fear of Jewish terrorism against the West that made the majority proposal the majority proposal. The disproportionately large land area that partition was accorded the Zionists was also in fear of Zionist terrorism. Again, quoting then secret British sources, giving the Zionists so much land up front in Resolution 181 was an attempt to delay, not prevent, but delay the Zionist expansionist wars that they knew would come. This appeasement, of course, failed because within a few months of Resolution 181, the Zionists were already waging their first expansionist war, seizing more than half of the Palestinian side of partition. But the fact that the British were occupying Palestine enabled Zionist leaders to juxtapose their terror campaign as a liberation movement. Their so-called war of independence was, in truth, to quote the British High Commissioner at the time, a guy by the name of Cunningham, Quote, operations based on the mortaring of terrified women and children. Its broadcasts boasting of their successes, quote, both in content and in matter of delivery are remarkably like those of Nazi Germany. The Zionists were, quote, jubilant with their campaign of calculated aggression coupled with brutality. In the Yishuv itself, quote, the persecution of Christian Jews 
I assume that means converts, and others who offend against national discipline, that is, Zionist edicts, has shown a marked increase and in some cases has reached medieval standards. All this, to be sure, before there was any Arab resistance. Finally, on the 15th of May, 1948, Britain fled the scene of its crime for which the Palestinians have been paying ever since. There is the sense that the situation calmed, became static after 1948. This is false. The ethnic cleansing and the terror attacks continued post-statehood, evolving with the new dynamics. Israel, now holding up the untenable catastrophe it had created and refused to rectify as the threat against which it now had to defend itself. But the victims were now, with rare exception, just the Palestinians. This refusal to rectify its crimes was, and remains today, a complete abrogation of the agreements upon which its admittance to the United Nations was conditioned. 100 years ago, MP Edwin Montague accused the British government of anti-Semitism for colluding with the Zionists. History has, to say the least, proven him correct. Now, obviously, the reason why Zionist pressure groups silence voices critical of Israel is to ensure that Israel can continue business as usual. These pressure groups wield influence by claiming to speak on behalf of Jews, and implicitly all Jews, in Zionism's tribal sense. Therefore, according to Zionism, Jews, simply by virtue of being Jews, want and power and are thus responsible for Israel's actions. Today, the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, promotes a definition of anti-Semitism that is engineered to empower new ethnic racial crimes. What greater betrayal of the memory of the Nazis' victims? Zionist organizations like the Board of Deputies of British Jews and the self-proclaimed Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, the CAA, exploit the smear of anti-Semitism in order to empower new ethnic racial crimes. This is anti-Semitic because it explicitly implicates Jews, because they are Jews, in the atrocities of the Israeli state. Settler colonialism's sell-by date expired a century ago. Zionism survived by couching itself in messianic pretenses, and without Western complicity, it would have ended seven decades ago, along with similar racial nationalist movements. Equality, democracy, secularism, and the unqualified right of return, all of which are morally and legally unassailable demands, will come when we deny Israel its smoke and mirrors. Thank you.